Uh, so if you have your Bibles, Ephesians chapter 4 <clears throat> is uh, where we're going to be, Ephesians 4. Uh, I've been walking through in Daily Thunder the series uh, looking at this idea of things that we are to put off and things we are to put on. Uh, and Paul begins that <clears throat> uh, at the beginning of verse 17 uh, in Ephesians chapter 4. And he's talking about this idea that we have a particular lifestyle outside of, outside of Christ. And there's, we were born with this uh, sinful, selfish, you know, uh, identity and focus. And Paul says, hey, you are to throw that off and you are to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the previous series, we were walking through just this idea of the clothing of a Christian. And uh, what we are doing in this particular series is we're getting into the specifics. So just to set the stage then, uh, Paul in Ephesians 4, uh, verse 22 through 24 says this. He says, lay aside in reference to your former conduct, the old man, that sinful, selfish propensity, that sinful nature that we have, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new man, speaking of Jesus Christ, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. So Paul says, just like an overcoat, you are to take off that old nature, that old lifestyle, that old thought process, and you are to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. That, that he is our robe of righteousness. He is those garments of salvation that we are to be wearing. And then as he comes into verse 25, he starts getting into the specifics. And I said this earlier, uh, but this whole section, as I was walking through it, I almost skipped it because I was like, I, 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 I don't have these problems. I, I don't have a lying issue. I, I'm not an angry person. I don't steal. I, you know, and I, I could go through the list. And what's amazing about God's word, and this is so profound to me, is that if we, if we come to the word openly and honestly and, uh, and, and humbly, God will take his word. I mean, we're talking Genesis through the maps. He will take his word and he will take that and poke it in your life and say, I, I could use that to change your life. So it's interesting to me, even though I would naturally just kind of go, yeah, 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 I'm okay. As I've been walking through each of these sections, uh, I've been so uh, convicted uh, so I'm bringing you in on that. Oh, praise the Lord. Uh, so we've looked at two of these. Uh, in verse 25, Paul says you're to put off lying. You're to get rid of lying. You're to just throw that away. And you're to put on truth. Again, lying is more than the words that come out of our mouth. What we're talking about uh, anything even on the inside that's making or anything. How should I say this? When I cause you to believe something that is not true, even if I speak true words, that's called lying. And the whole reason we are to speak truth one to another is because we're, in, we're a body. We are in fellowship with one another. And as the body of Christ, we are to actually look like our Lord and Savior, who is truth itself. Uh, in verse 26 and 27, Paul says you are to throw off any anger that is motivated by yourself, which is... 95% of our anger, right? I'm frustrated because, you know, you're, you're poking at my preferences and my time schedule and my plan and, and my whatever. And because you are, you know, have this affront to me, I get frustrated. Paul says, you're to throw that thing off. And if you are going to be angry, which then later Paul says, just don't be angry. But if you are going to be angry, make sure that it is an anger motivated by love. Because what you see throughout Scripture is that when God is angry, it's not a mean, nasty, wrathful, you know, evil kind of an anger. It's always motivated by love. And the reason Paul says that you are not to have the selfish kind of anger is because we are not to give place to the devil. We are not to side with him uh, in, in, our, in our lifestyle and our attitude. So as we're coming into this particular uh, concept, uh, we, are, we are looking at verse 28, which is the whole idea of stealing. And again, I don't, I don't know about you, but this is not my problem. And yet, this verse really speaks to me. Uh, so let's just get into this. Uh, it's interesting that as Paul is talking through each of these issues, Paul, you got to remember, is talking to the saints and the believers in Ephesus. So he's not talking to the pagans. He's not saying, hey, you evil, no good, rotten sinners, stop doing this. He's talking to you, saying, as a believer, stop doing these things. 
And, and here's the whole concept. Many of the early believers were coming out of pagan cultures. And one of the issues historians tell us that they had was that there was a lot of stealing going around, lying going around. Sounds like our culture, doesn't it? <laughs> and Paul says, okay, look, as Christians, if you're coming out of these pagan cultures, you're not just completed or perfected. You still need training in, in righteousness and in godly living. Otherwise, as Christians, we can easily slip back into old habits, routines, and sin. And you realize that as a believer, we are in a constant state of sanctification as we grow in godly maturity and Christ-likeness. In other words, you are not the finished product, which means we can all grow, we can all mature, we can all deepen, which is why Paul is saying, hey, let me, let me just give you some help here. This is what your life's supposed to look like. Uh, he does this in a variety of other places, by the way, uh, and I'll just give you two. But in Galatians chapter 5, Paul is talking about the, the, the works or the fruit of the flesh versus the works or the fruit of the Spirit. Again, put off one, put on the other. And, and Paul says this, Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarned you, just as I forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul says, get rid of this stuff. And again, he's talking to believers. So the assumption is when you come to Christ, you have everything you need to live a godly life, and yet we are being sanctified. And those old thought processes and those old, old behaviors and attitudes, they need to change. So we just can't presume that like, oh, I'm, I'm, I am perfect. I am done. I am being perfected, which means I need training in righteousness. I need those reminders of saying, you know, these things are wrong. You need to get rid of those out of your life. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 6, Paul says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither the sexual, sexual immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Again, we are to throw these things off and put on the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, th this is a very common theme throughout the New Testament where Paul is talking about this reality or the lifestyle of a believer. So as we come into our passage then, Paul says... All right, Christians, stop stealing. So let me read the passage. Uh, in Ephesians 4, 28, Paul says, He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. Uh, the word there for steal, stop stealing. The word there for steal uh, is the word klepto. And I don't know if you've ever heard that, but we have a word called kleptomaniac, which is someone who just cannot stop taking things. So, you know, as a little kid, you start with like pipe cleaners. That's what I did. <laughs> we were at a craft store and uh, apparently, I, I was too young to remember, but I, I, had, I loved pipe cleaners because they were super soft, apparently. And so I grabbed a whole bunch. I took them outside. We're in the car. Mom goes, what are those? I was like, but they're soft. Uh, and then she made me come back in and apologize. Bawling. Uh, but, you know, you move from pipe cleaners to, like, stealing candy to stealing your parents' credit cards to, like, you know, taking a, taking a car itself to, you know, to, to taking over the whole world, right? So a kleptomaniac is those people who just, they just cannot stop themselves from just taking things, right? So we, we, we know this word. But the word for steal means to steal. Isn't that a great definition? Uh, to commit a theft or to take away by stealth. Now, that word, klepto, is used 13 times in the New Testament, and it's interesting that four of those 13 times, it's in direct reference to the Old Testament Ten Commandments, where in Exodus 20, verse 15, God says, do not steal. Now, I find it interesting that this is the second time in this list. We've gone through lying, anger, and now stealing. This is the second time that Paul has really reached back into the Old Testament and says, God has said, and again, he references the Ten Commandments, do not lie, do not steal. And I, I think I said this the other day when we we're looking at the lying thing, but have you ever pondered why is it that God gave us the Ten Commandments? 
Like, like, is it just merely a good list of things in community to do and not do? In other words, right, I, if we're going to be in community, I probably should not murder you. Because <laughs> that would really help the community. Right? Like, if, if I steal from you or if I lie, right, it, it's going to break down community. But I actually, though that's true, I don't think that's why God gave the Ten Commandments. God gave the Ten Commandments, one, because it's a revelation of who he is. I mean, that is the primary. God says, this is my nature. So ponder this. God says, I am not a liar. I am truth. I cannot lie. And you call yourself my people. So as my people, when you lie, what you're actually demonstrating to the the world around you is that your God is a liar. I'm not a liar, so you can't lie. Does that make sense? God says, I'm not a murderer, so you can't murder. Hey, I'm not a thief, so you can't steal. Are you getting this? So when you look at the Ten Commandments, it is a revelation of who our God is. And because he is this way and we are his image bearers, you realize we are to reflect and demonstrate the very character of our God. So Paul is leveraging this and he says, look, God is not a thief. And in the Ten Commandments, he says, don't steal. So therefore, guess what you can't do? You can't steal. Because every time you steal, you are declaring to the world around you that our God is a thief. He's not a thief, so you can't do it either. Uh, in, in Romans, Paul says it this way. He's quoting the Old Testament. And he says, for this, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Do you recognize that the fulfillment of the law is love? And if we are in a body together and I genuinely love you with the love of Christ, that would prohibit me from stealing from you. Like I just, I couldn't do it. Why? Because I love you. And if I have a genuine affection and care for you, and again, love is not just the the feeling good emotion stuff. Right? It's a self-sacrificing, pour your life out, bleed, suffer, die kind of a love. If I have that for you, why would I take from you? Because the whole essence of love is give, 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 give. Not beautiful. I think that's beautiful. I don't know what you guys are thinking this morning. Now, as we look at this idea of stealing, I really want to emphasize that we're talking more than material stuff. I don't know what you think of when you think of, well, I know what you think of when you think of stealing. I think of physical. I immediately go to, okay, I probably shouldn't steal money. I shouldn't steal cars, right? I shouldn't steal a parent's credit card, you know, right? I I shouldn't steal pipe cleaners, you know? (laughs) Like, like there are things I probably should not steal because they're physical. But do you recognize that scripturally, though physical is important, it goes far beyond the physical? Because there's a lot of things you can steal that you can't touch, Uh, there's that great London preacher, D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, and and this is what he said about this passage. I just thought it was really a great insight when it comes to this idea of thievery. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, stealing really means taking possession of and using as your own something that does not belong to you, appropriating something that is not yours to serve your own needs and your own gratification. So it applies to many many things besides actual material things. We can steal money, yes, but we can also steal time. We can steal almost anything. We can steal thoughts. We can steal ideas. The offense that we often call plagiarism, the taking of another man's ideas and giving them out as your own. He goes on and says this, stealing is to take possession, sorry, stealing is to take possession of anything that belongs to another and that is not really yours, and to possess it, and to regard it as yours, and to give the impression that it is yours. So do you recognize that there's actually a lot of things that you could steal that are not physical that are still counted as stealing? Uh, William McDonald, in, in his commentary, says this, stealing may take many forms, all the way from grand larceny to non-payment of debts, to witnessing for Christ on an employer's time, to plagiarism, to the use of false measurements, and to falsifying expense accounts. In other words, when you start looking at this idea of stealing, yeah, the material one's important, right? You know, the money, the resources, the possessions, the material goods. Yes, that's, that's thievery, but, but we can steal time. For example, I'm, I'm, I'm getting paid at my job to do a job, 
And here I am secretly behind the scenes playing Candy Crush. I don't know what, I, I don't know what people play. Angry Birds. I don't know what the thing is today. But uh, one of those things. Obviously, I have no idea what I'm talking about. Uh, <clears throat> I just heard the name Candy Crush. So I'm presuming that's an actual game. Right? But, but, but we can still time. We, we, you know, we could be scrolling through Instagram or, or something. Now, if our employer gives us a permission, yeah, that makes sense. But for most of us, we just secretly do it. Do you know what that's actually called? Stealing. Because you're getting paid to do a job, and what are you doing instead? You're doing... Uh, you can steal ideas. Uh, you could steal credit. Right? When, when, when credit is being passed out, hey, who did this? And you're like, ha, 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 it was all me. Right? You, you can steal that kind of stuff. You recognize probably the one that we're most guilty of is stealing the glory of God. When, when, you know, when, when we're living our lives in such a way where we're trying to draw and capture the attention of the people around us, and instead of giving glory to God, we're actually taking that glory for ourselves. Do you know what that's called? Stealing. And Paul says, you are to steal no longer. Hey, you should throw this off. This should not be a part of your life as a believer. Again, it's not, his, it's not God's character. It's not his nature. And, and therefore, if you call yourself a Christian, his character needs to mark your life. And every time I steal, and this is so hard, but do you recognize every time I steal, I'm actually siding with the enemy? Uh, Jesus in John 10, 10 says the thief, speaking of the devil, he comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. So when, when I live in that thievery mindset, whether it's physical or immaterial, I'm actually siding with the enemy, and I'm actually declaring with my life that God is a thief. God says, I'm not a thief. So you cannot steal. So then the question comes, well, what am I supposed to do? And Paul says, how about this? I have a great idea for you. Rather than stealing, and you understand, he's talking to a culture that in his day, uh, wages were very low. It was very hard to survive. And there's, he's not talking to Americans. And I know, I know we have difficulties. I get that. But in the ancient Roman world, it was, it was really hard if you were a servant or a slave or just the working class to survive. And so, therefore, it was very common to have to go and steal things. Uh, if you were an employer, right, and you had this grand estate, it was very easy to just take your excess and, 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 and hoard and not give it, give it out. Why? Because it's just that's, just, that's normal human living, folks. And so Paul says, hey, how about this? Rather than having this thievery and this stealing going on in your life, I have something better for you. And Paul says this. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. Now, I don't know about you, but growing up, labor in my little kid mind sounded like a curse word because I didn't want to do it, right? Clean your room. What is that? That sounds laborious, right? It's labor. I don't want to do that. And I think as we get older, right, we know we have to go down to our jobs and, oh, bummer, I guess I got to do this. And, and, and the idea of work and labor just sounds like a part of the curse. Because aren't you glad for Jesus to return and redeem us and get us out of all this sin-scarred world so that we don't have to work anymore? And yet what you discover back in Genesis is that work and labor was not a result of the fall. It was actually given in Genesis 1 before the fall. Which means, guess what? You were made for work. Please contain your excitement. Please stay seated. But, but do you recognize that work actually is a good and godly thing? Labor is actually grand. And we were made to labor. We thrive in labor. Okay. That's phenomenal, folks. Because when you start looking at this idea of labor and, and, and work... Most of us assume it's just like, well, I've got to labor. And it's true. Laboring is harder after the curse. I get that. But work and labor is actually a privilege. It's actually supposed to be a joy. You were made to work. You were made to labor. 
So Paul says, whoa, instead of stealing, what if you would begin to work? Uh, that word for labor, and this, this will just probably tick a few of you off, but labor, that word, so interesting, it means to grow weary. It means to tire out, to be exhausted with toil, to work to the point of fatigue or extreme exhaustion. Now, I don't know if you've ever worked like that. Uh, we've had a few guys in here <laughs> this last night doing it, right? Where, where you're, you're laboring and you're, 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 there's such an effort that you get done at the end of the day and you're just like, I am exhausted, right? That's what Paul's talking about. So think about the extremes. Paul says, rather <clears throat> than stealing and grabbing, he says, I, I want you to just, just be exhausted. Wear yourself out in labor. And by the way, both of those are commands. So there's an interesting contrast in this command where Paul is commanding you, do not steal. And then he turns around and commands you, work like a dog. I don't know how dogs work. Work Work like crazy. I mean, just wear yourself out. Make sense? So this is, this is not a suggestion. Uh, this is not like a grand idea. Uh, this, is, this is heavy. This is in your face. This is a command. Paul says, you have got to get this thing done. Just, just exhaust yourself in laboring. Now, you need rest. I understand that. But the idea is, 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 is extreme effort. Uh, one of the ways that this word is used, the labor uh, is in this idea in 2 Timothy 2.6, Paul says the hardworking, it's that word labor, farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. Have you ever seen a farmer, farmers toil and labor and work to the point of exhaustion? Isn't that interesting? That, that this word is, is associated with that idea of like farming, where you get up at the crack of dawn, you're working all day long. If you have a spare moment, you're always fixing something. At the end of the day, you just, you just crash. Paul says, I want you to do that in whatever you're, whatever you're laboring in. I want you to work hard. I want you to give it your full intensity. I, I want you to be worn out at the end of the day. Stop being passive and just stealing things. I mean, just, just stop, stop doing the easy thing and, and just grabbing whatever you can grab. Instead, hey, would you labor? Would you have effort? Would you just, would you just give yourself to this? And he says, he goes on, he says, performing with his own hands what is good. In other words, he says that you are to labor or work in things that are useful or, or good or upright or honorable. In other words, don't just do any kind of work. Do that which is actually good. Do you realize that there are certain industries Christians probably should not be laboring in? For example, human trafficking. Don't work in that. If you want to work against that, that's good. But don't, hey, don't propagate the junk of the world. That makes sense? So Paul says, if you're going to labor and exhaust yourself and just, just go crazy in this effort, hey, do it, but make sure it's done in a, in a good, right, and, and honorable way. Now, I just want to have a really quick point of clarification. There is a statement, and, I, and you know this passage, but in 2 Thessalonians 3.10, Paul says, For even when we were with you, we used to command this to you. If anyone is not willing to work, neither let him eat. There is something about the fact that you need to be a worker. But when you look at this idea of labor and work, and I really liked what Warren Wiersbe said about this. He says this, Paul was not writing to believers who could not work because of handicaps, but those who would not work. And there is a very distinct difference. In other words, he's saying you should have effort and you should toil yourself. And that is a presumption that you can. Does that make sense? Here's, here's, I guess, where I'm trying to get to all this. Why? why? Why is Paul so strong about don't steal and labor, just go crazy, exhaust yourself? Why is Paul so strong on that? And he actually defines and gives the purpose of this whole thing. And, and he says this at the end of verse 28. So that you would have something to share with the one who has need. Do you realize that the point of laboring is not so that you would have something, but so that you would always have something to give others. That is such a shift in our, in our world today. I mean, why, why do I labor? Why do I work eight hours down at the job? 
Well, so that I can have a nice home and so I can provide for my family. And, and there's truth in that. You need to provide for your family. And yet, Paul says the, the greater reason why you should labor and exhaust yourself and stop stealing is not actually so that you actually have something. It's so that you have something to give. That you're always ready to give something. That, that word to share, you're always ready to share. The word is really interesting. It has this idea of to impart or to give, but it's actually two Greek words. And it's the word to give, but then it has this prefix, meta, on the front, which means with. And when you get into the idea of what the word is really saying, it's giving something, but not just giving something. It's giving something while having an investment or a share in the person or in the giving itself. Does that make any sense to you? In other words, it's not just like, well, I guess I'll just give you $5 because you really need a handout. The idea is I'm going to give you $5, but in the $5 of me giving it to you, I'm not just interested in giving you a handout. I'm interested in investing in you so I can see something come out of it. In other words, this is not like, all right, we're going to take up a collection this morning. We should do this. Uh, we're going to take up a collection this morning. And uh, we're, we're going to give it, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to take it, I mean, I'll be happy to take it if you want to collect something, but, uh, but we're actually going to take up a collection and we're going to give it to foreign missions. And you're like, praise the Lord, I am not interested in foreign missions, but I feel guilty, I'll give 50 bucks. That's not what Paul's saying. Paul is saying, all right, we're going to take a collection this morning, we're going to give it to foreign missions. And you're like, oh, I got to give $50, but I don't want to just give money. I, I, I've, I, this is an investment so I, I want to hear about what's going on in the missions. I'm going to be praying for those missionaries. Man, I, I am go, I'm going to go over there and visit them and encourage them. I'm going to be writing them notes. Why? Because I have an investment and a share in what is taking place. Do you realize how that changes giving? I, I think for a lot of us in the American culture, we have this thought that it's like, well, I, I, yeah, there's all these needs. So, all right, I'll, I'll work a really hard job and I'll just write some checks. Nobody does that. I'll, I'll, I'll get on Apple Pay and just, you know, shoot some money over to these needs because I, I don't actually want to be involved in those things. I just, I, I just want to feel good that I'm doing something. Paul says, that's not the kind of giving I want you to do. I, I want you to have a giving where you are invested in the very thing that you are giving. So if you're going to be giving money to an individual, you're to invest yourself in the individual. Does this, does this make any sense? That changes things, folks. Uh, and that word, th this whole idea of to, to invest in, to, to share in, it's used five times in the New Testament. One, obviously, is our passage. But let me just give you the four other times this word is used because I'm, I'm so intrigued by this idea uh, of not just giving, because that word is in Scripture, but not just giving, but giving with this mentality of investing. So here, here's the five times it's used. In Luke 3.11, it says, and he would answer and say to them, the man, this is Jesus speaking, the man who has two tunics is to share, that's our word, with him who has none, and he who has food is to do likewise. We're not just talking quick handouts. We're talking about the fact that if you are going to actually give your coat, do you realize what you're actually doing is you are, you are investing in the individual? Or, or, or look at Romans 1.11. Paul says, for I long to see you so that I may impart, that's our word, some spiritual gift to you so that you may be strengthened. Do you know, do you know what spiritual gifts are all about? Investment. That, that it's not just for you, but as you are living out of a spiritual gift, as you are pouring and giving into other people, do you realize it is an investment? Which I think is a great idea. Or look at Romans 12. Paul says, speaking of spiritual gifts, uh, that they differ according to the grace given to us. And then he says, to the one that exhorts, in his exhortation, he who gives with generosity, with, uh, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. And there's this idea that when, you are, when you're walking in spiritual gifts, that you're not just giving the gift, you're actually investing in the people and the community in which you are demonstrating the spiritual gift. Does that make any sense? I think that's really neat. Or 1 Thessalonians 2.8. Paul says, in this way, having fond affection for you, we were pleased to impart to you not only the gospel, but also our own lives because you have become beloved to us. 
Paul says, I, I didn't just give you some words of truth and you embrace the gospel. Rather, I invested myself in you as I shared the gospel. Wouldn't it be neat if we had that with this idea of giving? That, that as Paul says, hey, don't steal, you are to give. Our whole thought wasn't just, okay, well, I'll, I'll give you something so you can get out of my way and I can get on with my day. The whole idea is, oh, I, I want to throw my life and I want to invest. I want to... So here's, here's the whole point. What would it look like if you always had something to give? I'm not just talking money. Because again, we're, we're, we're going beyond just the, the physical, material kind of thing. But, but what if I was always ready in every area of my life with something to give? And, and yes, that, that may mean resource. Now, I know a lot of us in this room are not rich. I'm trying to look for a good word. Most of us, I know a lot of people in this room do not have a lot of money. We're like, I'll take the help. <laughs> But even the little resource that you have, what would it look like if he says, Lord, here it is. And I I have two quarters in my pocket. If you want to use this for someone else, I'm open. Like, like what if that was your heart? What if what little you had, you were were always willing to give that away? Because we have, I don't know about you, but we have such a limited resource mentality. But biblically, there's actually this whole idea of abundance. That, that, if, that if I give away that which I have, God seems to be like, oh, okay, I'll give you more. And then he entrusts me with more. And if I'm willing to give that away, he entrusts me with more. And this is not about you get healthy, wealthy, and wise. This is not a prosperity thing. Do you recognize that what resource you have, he has given you, not just so you can hoard it, it's so that you can give it. Is this making sense? But, but, but again, come, come out of the financial or, or the... Uh, the material thing. Do you realize that all of us, whether or not we have money, all of us have time. And we live in a culture that all of us are busy. All of us are busy. But wouldn't it be interesting if, if, you, if you lived in such a way as a Christian that you always had time to share with those in need? When someone says, hey, do you have a second? And my first thought is, no. Because you're not going to take a second. You're going to take an hour. And I I am tired, I am busy, I got things to do. But what if you had the thought process that I'm a Christian? And in what resource God has given me, I'm actually always willing and ready to have something to give. Now, I may not be able to give you an hour, but what if I had something to give you? Sure, I got five minutes. Like, like what if if we looked at our time? Uh, What if we looked at uh, our, 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 our wisdom? What if we looked at our resource, our finances? Well, what if we looked at, what if we just looked at everything in our life as something that God has entrusted to us so that we would have something ready to give? Does that make any sense to you? Uh, wouldn't it be interesting as you spent time in the word and in prayer every day that it wasn't just for your own spiritual benefit? What if you actually saw your time in the word and your time in prayer as an investment and in trust uh, or a uh, trust that God has given you so that you would actually have that always ready to share. Does this make sense? Like, like what, if, what if every area of your life, God says, I, I, have, I have given you something. I've entrusted something to you. I've given you time. I've given you resource. I've given you wisdom. I, I've given you biblical insight. I, I've, given you, I've given you these things. I've given you, uh, like we have people in this room who are so brilliant at practical things. Like, I, I, I am not, I, I know how to do nothing. I mean, I, I know how to turn on a light. But, I mean, it's like to fix things, I'm like, I'm always calling Nick or I'm looking at Evan or I'm, you know, looking at people in this room where I'm like, please help me because I don't know how to do these things. Is, and I, it is such a blessing to me when they're like, all right, yes, you're an idiot. But, I, yes, I'll come and I'll give you that which I have. Because it's a blessing to me. And I'm not having to pay thousands of dollars for someone to fix something. I, I can just, you know, tell Nick thanks. <laughs> but what if, we, what if we had this in our life? Where we just said, oh, I always have something ready to give. Hey, I've, I've got an encouragement for you. Because God's given me encouragement. And God's given me joy. And God's given me peace. And he's given me love. And he's, 
So again, this is, this is beyond just financial stuff. It includes that. But this is beyond the financial stuff. This is every area of our life. What, what if you were just always ready with what God has entrusted to you to, to pour out and give that to people? I mean, could, could you, have you ever been around a person who is just always joyful? And it's just like you spend a few minutes with someone who's just so excited, and you're just like, whoa, I don't know why I'm excited, but I'm excited too. See, what if, what if we had that for people? What, what if the peace that God has given upon you, what if that could somehow spill out to the people around you? What if you're down at your job and you could be given encouragement and, and you could be giving you know, wisdom and you could be giving time and you could be giving... Do you realize that a Christian is someone who is always ready to give? Not just financially, because sometimes what someone actually needs is not the finances. They may, they may think they need the finances, but what they need is something far better, folks. But what, but what if you were always in this posture of readiness, so you always had something to give to the one who had need? In the Old Testament, there was this idea of, it was the law of gleaning. And here, here I have this field with some wheat. And as I'm going out in the harvest, I'm, I'm to, you know, thresh and, you know, cut down all the wheat kind of stuff. And the law of the Old Testament was that I was to leave the edges. Why? So that there was something there for those who had need. And if you were hungry and you didn't have a field, you could come over and you could come and you could take some of my wheat. See, what if, what if we just had that attitude in every area of our life? Uh, here's what uh, William McDonald said in the commentary. Just this whole thought process, he says this, this is radical and revolutionary. The natural approach is for men to work for the supply of their own needs and desires. When their income rises, their standard of living rises. Everything in their lives revolves around self. This verse, speaking of Ephesians 4, 28, suggests a nobler, more exalted view of secular employment. It is a means of supplying a modest standard of living for one's family, but also of, of alleviating human needs, spiritual and temporal, at home and abroad, and how vast that need is. Wouldn't it be amazing if you got a pay increase? If you didn't go, whoa, I'm going on vacation. What if you went, whoa, Lord, what do you want to do with this? See, what, what if you were ready? Uh, it was interesting, uh, th- like two days ago, I had, I had had some guys come in and stay with me at the house, and uh, they were leaving on, on early, early Friday morning uh, to go back home, and they got to the airport, and they waited in a really long line, and uh, all, all being said, we had plenty of time, but because of this particular airline, they missed their flight, and all this kind of stuff, and so they're young college students, so they called, and they're like, Nathan, what do we do, and I'm like, not a big deal, it's going to be fine, and I had no idea. But I knew it was going to be fine. Because I just, and I just reminded him, I says, hey, you guys got to start leaping in, right in the airport. Just start jumping, like leap for joy uh, and smile because there, there's a purpose in this and there's a plan. And so I, I got online and this is like five in the morning and I'm looking at airlines and, you know, and going, Lord, you're going to have to provide something because they need to get home. And, and I, I finally found this flight with Southwest and uh, it, it cost, I think it was $700. No, it was almost $800 for them to, because of the airline mix-up and the airline wouldn't do anything and they were just like, sorry, this is not our problem. Uh, anyway, they, they got to pay $800. They don't have $800. And I just said, I'll, 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 I don't have it either, but I'll pay for it. And I just said, Lord, I'm just going to trust you. And I, I'm, I'm trusting in provision. And it's interesting, at the exact same time that I was paying for the tickets, someone donated $800 to, the, to, to Deeper Christian. And I didn't find that out till later. But I was just like, that is the coolest thing ever. And I just said, Lord, I, I, just, I don't have a lot, but what little I have, I'm willing just to give. And do you realize that the Lord is so faithful? Wouldn't it be neat to always live that way? I don't know if you've ever read Brother Andrew's story in God Smuggler, but the stories, or Hudson Taylor, I mean, you start going through the list. William Booth, Amy Carmichael, Gladys Elward. And you start reading these stories where, you know, Brother Andrew is the, the law, the royal way, is that what it's called? But there's this whole idea that if he ever had resource and someone needed a resource, if he had it, he'd always give it trust and trust that God would supply. And it, it is amazing to see some of these stories come out of Brother Andrew's life where you're just like, that is dumb, dude. Like, don't, don't, dude. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. Uh, but that is dumb. Don't, don't do that. 
And yet what you see is this heart of giving that just, why? He's, they're always ready to give in time of need. Again, there is a physical resource that, that, that this is true in, but again, for, for some of us, time is actually probably more valuable than our money. Or, or, or what about wisdom? Or what about our talent? Or, or what about, in other words, are, are, you, are you willing to always have something to give? Uh, John Wesley said it this way. He says, work as hard as you can, make as much as you can, and give as much as you can. I love that thought. Uh, when Paul was speaking to the elders of Ephesus in, in Acts chapter 20, l- listen to what Paul says. Or reminds them. He says, In everything I showed you that by laboring in this manner, you must help the weak and remember the words of Jesus Christ. That Jesus himself said this, It is more blessed to give than receive. Do you realize that as a Christian, it actually should be our joy to always have something to give? Money, time, ideas, prayer, encouragement. See, what if, what if God has given you an entrustment not so you can hoard and not so you can grab and not so you can just take and not, not just so you can be passive and take the easy way, but, but what if you looked at everything in your life and, and all the different areas of, of your existence and you said, God, I have everything or everything that you've given me, it is available to you for you to do with as you wish. Lord, I just want to be ready to give. Because as Jesus said, which is funny because you can't find this in the Gospels, but Jesus himself said this, in scripture, it is more blessed to give than receive. That you actually get the blessing when you have that heart of just pouring out. Let me just close with this. In, in 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8, it's, it's interesting. Paul, do you realize that when he went into a new community, uh, he didn't take, he didn't just grab. Paul labored. He, he, he was a tent maker. And so rather than taking resource from, from ministry funds, he says, okay, I'm going to labor really hard so that we can use this money elsewhere. But, and, and listen to what Paul says in all this. He says, now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows with blessing will also reap with blessing. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, pause. Do you realize that you can listen to this kind of a message and be like, all right, I guess I'll give. And you can do it. But the motive of your heart actually matters in this. And God loves a cheerful giver. If you're going to give, just give extravagantly and smile while you do it. Don't, don't just be like, oh, fine, I'll, I'll give because I have to give. And then listen to what Paul says. It's becoming one of my favorite passages in 2 Corinthians 9.8. Out of, out of this context, Paul says, God is able. So think about this. Here you are, a cheerful giver. And Paul says, God is able to make every grace abound to you. Everything that you need, every supply that you need to live. Peter in 2 Peter 1.3 says, everything you need for life and godliness is found in Christ Jesus. And every grace has been supplied to you. Everything that you need, God is, God is supplying. Why? He is able. So you can be lavish and cheerful and crazy in your giving. And do what God's going to do. God is able. What is he able to do? Well, he's able to make every grace abound to you. And then listen to this. So that in everything, at every time, having every sufficiency, you may have an abundance for every good deed. Do you know what Paul is saying? Paul is saying that God is more than sufficient to fill your needs. So give. Go crazy. So in our passage, Paul says you're to put off that former sinful, selfish way of living. You're to just toss that thing away, throw it off. That includes stealing. Quit hoarding. Quit stealing. Quit grabbing. Quit just... And instead, work like crazy. Just be exhausted. Why? Not so I can have something. Yes, I need to care for my family. Yes, I need to care for my household. I get all that. But the reason I'm to work like a dog or an ox or whatever it is that we're working like, the reason I'm to work and labor and, and tire myself out is not just so I can hoard and have something. It's so that I can just whoa, be lavish in my giving. And I'm going to trust 
that in my time, I'm going to trust that in my resource, I'm, I'm going to trust in my intellect, uh, I'm going to trust in, 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 my, in my joy and in my peace and in my love and everything that God's entrusted to me. I'm going to trust that God is more than able to supply that which I need. And he's able to make up the difference and he's able to just... Wouldn't it be neat if we lived like that? I mean, wouldn't it be amazing if this community was known as the crazy people who just always lavishly gave? I think we'd have to call ourselves Christians. Wouldn't we? I want that, folks. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, we, we want to be givers. And Lord, you have given us so much. You've given us life and forgiveness, joy, life, peace, love. You've given us time. And especially for us in the American culture, you have given us resource. Lord, what would it look like if, if we would not steal any longer, but, but that we would, oh God, that we would be givers, cheerful, lavish givers of anything and everything that we have. Oh Lord, could you allow us to walk in trust and faith that when we give, that we, we trust that you will supply. That, that Lord, that, that, that we don't feel like we have to grab and protect and hoard, but we just have the attitude of like, sure, here you go. Lord, will you give us opportunity this week to be a cheerful giver? And Lord, we thank you that we can put off the former way of living and put on the new reality, which is you. Lord, we give you the praise and the glory. We love you. In your precious name we pray. Amen.